non rock a boatus must stop. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to sink it. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy? Or are you going to bite? Right. Delusional. Yeah, I love you, Jeff. Delusional. Yeah. Delusional is okay in your worldview. I'm an animal. You don't chastise chickens for being delusional. You don't chastise pigs for being delusional. So you calling me delusional using your worldview is perfectly okay. It doesn't really hurt. <laughs> she hung up on me. Yes! Oh! Yes! What? What? Desperate times call for faithful men and not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. Go into all the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and make buddies. Not to make brosives. Right. Don't go into the world and make homies. Right. Disciples. Well, I, yeah. got, I got a bit of a jiggle neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Pastor. No. When we have the real message of truth, we cannot let somebody say they're speaking truth when yeah. they're not. Alright guys, welcome to Apologia Radio, Psalm 22 y'all, 2227, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Mm. What's up guys, ApologiaStudios.com, that's where you guys go to get more, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A Studios.com. Go to that website, guys. Tons of content there for you. Hundreds of podcasts and radio episodes. Actually, when we were on terrestrial radio, you've got lots and lots of great help from theologians, scholars, scientists. Uh, just It's a, a whole treasury of amazing, uh, insightful episodes with some great, great people. Uh, lots of cultural engagement, so if you guys uh, have time to kill, you want to have some edifying content, go to ApologiaStudios.com. Also... If you go to ApologiaStudios.com, what are you showing? Are you showing baseball? <laughs> like I saw, I, all I saw was a puppy and some baseball. What is going on over here? Um, also, he's got his, uh, Pastor Luke's favorite team well, represented right here. Before we get started, I need to have a conversation. Well, we're going to jump right into that, yes. So, uh, ApologiaStudios.com, guys, go there. When you go there, sign up for All Access. When you sign up for All Access, everybody, you make everything we do possible. So, if you've been on this channel, and whatever you see... And, I mean, I'm telling you, whatever you see, if you see on the street evangelism, work at the abortion mills, if you see public debates, if you see teaching, if you see any evangelism, whatever you're seeing, you're seeing as a result of people just like you who partner with us in ministry. You put your hand in our hand and uh, you're doing this with us. And so all access helps us as a ministry to do all of this content. I just saw, and I, it was amazing. Just the other day I was looking... Um, for a video to send, I think James was asking me for a video, and a, a video came up and I saw like a comment, and uh, it was like a recent comment within the last day. It was just a random video out of like 1,400 videos, and it was a person that said, I just watched this and I just came to Christ wow. watching it. Mm. And I was thinking to myself, there's so many videos I don't even know, like right. we don't even, because we, we don't really look at the comments. You would kill yourself if yeah, you did. Yeah, it's, it's bad. Um, but I, praise God. And so I want to thank you. Just saying that, I want to hopefully encourage everybody who is partnering with us in ministry. You did that uh, with us. So thank you so much for being the means that God used to bring that person to Christ and uh, to give them the gospel. So when you sign up for All Access, don't forget, you also get all the TV shows, the after shows, Apology Academy, which is constantly being updated. You get the new show from Cultish. It's the aftermath. Uh, just lots of stuff. We have also all, a ton of stuff from Apology Studios. You've got Sheologians, the podcast with Summer and Joy. You've got Cultish. You've got Provoked with Pastor Zach and Desi. You've got Apology Radio. So great stuff. And all of it's happening because of you partnering with us. So thank you. Uh, so much for all that you guys are doing. And uh, also, and I'll say one final word here as we jump into the episode, endabortionnow.com. Go to endabortionnow.com. Get your church signed up to go out to preach the gospel, to offer help and love to mothers and fathers who were uh, thinking of killing their children. Uh, thousands of, of children are alive today. Mm -hmm. Hard to wrap my mind around that. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. I can only look at one face at a time. Thousands and thousands of children alive today because Christians just like you heard this said, I'm going to try, went to endabortionnow.com, your church got signed up, 
You got all the free training, all the free resources, by the way, provided by other Christians who love you and gave to this ministry, and they're out saving lives. Uh, it's happening on a regular basis. We can't even keep up with it all. And uh, all that's happening because of what's happening at endabortionnow.com. So go there, get signed up. All of it's free. We don't want anything from you. We just want to give everything away to you. We want to see you saving children from death. We want to work for the criminalization of abortion. And, well, let's go. I also wanted to say, of course, thank you to that person who did that super chat. A couple of people. A yeah. couple of people. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Yes, thank you guys for giving even through the super chat. It's a big blessing to us. Thank you yeah. guys so, so much. Thank you. So, I think... Um, I was on my sabbatical. I just got back. Um, How was and it? I missed one. It was very good. Thank you. I, I missed, missed Show more Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs> you know I don't roll on Shabbos. <laughs> I don't roll on Shabbos. <laughs> um, and so I missed, you know, I missed the last show. Um, and I uh, was watching it and uh, noticed that, that Isaac uh, publicly bore false witness against me. Did he? He that's slandered, false witness. That's slandered that's me. Actual false witness. Yes. That's really. strong language. This is serious. Absolutely. It's an actual charge happening right here live it's happening on the radio live. program. And wow. there's two witnesses because I was here for it. Yeah, and well, there's it's at least two witnesses. At least of witnesses. there's thousands of witnesses yeah. okay. to that. All right. All right. So I wanted to make sure before we got started that Isaac and I were properly reconciled before the show started because I was hoping for repentance ah, from repentance. Isaac for for the lies he said about wow. me. Wow! And the lies were I didn't concerning. Know gonna, I didn't know you were The lies were concerning. Uh, uh, he he told everyone that I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. Dallas Cowboys fan. This is and the team that is the best team in the world that hasn't won for like 30 years. Yeah, exactly. So right? I, I will say this, Jeff. Yeah. Did also. He doesn't I, know what he's talking about. I don't know what oh, I'm okay. talking about. Okay. I, I'm completely okay. in the dark. So, right. I'm in the dark. Okay. But then, but I just saw for all of our litness, our litnessers, our litnesses, <laughs> litnessers, <laughs> uh, you know, I, Isaac said, "Hey, send Luke, uh, you know, Cowboys stuff to the PO box." I think you did that selfishly. He so still loves Cowboy stuff. People and could send it to you. If you send it to me, I'm burning it. Yeah. So <laughs> P.O. Box 1545 Chandler, yeah. Arizona 85244 yeah. is where you can go to send all of the Cowboys uh, memorabilia <laughs> there to you go. Pastor yes. Luke. And I, so I, we sit down to record today, and then he t- he put the camera that's usually on me. It's on himself now. Right. So I was like, what is happening? Yep. Wow. He's I missed one in. show, wow. and he's just trying to he's push me out. swooping in. He's swoop- <laughs> okay. One. Okay. The Dallas Cowboy thing, yes. I thought it was funny. Uh, I figured people would be willing to send you the mem- memorabilia so go more you. than me. Oh, but yeah, I see. Thinking, I got you. Okay. I was hoping that maybe... If it was like he, a shirt or something, you, you it's know, not going to fit you. That's true. See, <laughs> it's if pajamas. He does, <laughs> if he didn't see the episode, right, and I go yeah. pick up the mail... Right. And then you would just sa- get the stuff. I'd get the stuff. But that, that, would was, a good, be, I mean, that was a good plan. And then that would be theft. That would because be then he's stealing <laughs> property. It's all a so joke, folks. You're, it, well, all a joke. Hey, hey have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen anything irrespective of its value? Even Dallas memorabilia? Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. So you're a lying, hey, thieving... The camera, though. The camera. Okay. I don't care about the camera. The camera. I did ask... No one wants to see you my face. on you. But also, too, I didn't know if Luke was going to be here on time. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. yeah. Well, I, it's, it, we, we did throw this together as quickly as possible because we have to get... We have a tight schedule today oh, yeah. here at Apology Busy day. Studios. Busy day. We're doing a lot, actually. Lots happening next week. I will save all of that for you guys for later. Uh, also, ask that you continue your prayers for Apology All Access and the things we're trying to yes. do to add to that. Yes. Uh, please join us in praying for it because some big things could happen with All Access that would change everything. All right. So, hey, we're going to get right into it. You guys see the title of the show today. Book of Revelation explains. P- singular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Bo- Revelations. Revelations. People say that in Revelations 1. No, it's Revelation. It's the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Book of Revelation explains. I We we wanted to do this. I'll, I'll tell you why. A couple things added to like wanting this to take place. Um, number one, uh, did a recent uh, podcast, an episode with Ali Stuckey. If you don't know her, get to know her. Allie Beth Stuckey. She has a great channel, great content, solid believer who just puts out some great cultural engagement. She's had some of the best on uh, and uh, just really appreciate her. Love everything she's doing uh, a lot. Uh, So that show we talked about, are we living in the end times? It was like a two-part episode and uh, I I thought, you know, sort of a crash course answering some important questions. Allie's asking a lot of questions right now about end time stuff and so she had me on. We talk about end time stuff and post-millennialism, the victory of the kingdom of the Messiah within history, but also I've been having a lot of conversations lately with Isaac. Uh, If you don't know, 
We've known Isaac uh, uh, since 2008, I think, 2009, 2009. somewhere 2009. Mm-hmm. And uh, Isaac has, has been, we, he's one of our best friends. We love him. He's also a phenomenal teacher, a phenomenal teacher. Um, and he leads Icon Student Ministries at Apologia Church and does a lot of the stuff in the background. Isaac's a big part of everything that happens here. But if you haven't had the benefit yet of hearing Isaac teach, then you are today. So Isaac's been talking to me a lot lately we'll about, your notes wow. ready. Yeah. about uh, <laughs> overarching themes. So what we're going to do today is this. If you're, just blank. Yeah, if you're into the end times discussion, <laughs> we want to do two episodes. We're going to do one today. Right now you're watching. Uh, we're going to do one next week on Thursday. We'll drop it then. And we're going to talk about, uh, I guess, two different aspects of eschatology and really sort of explaining uh, what the scriptures teach about the Messiah's kingdom. And then this is where I wanted Isaac to be on, overarching themes that run throughout the Bible that it's really like, it's like what the story is about. So like, it's not just pot shot verses yeah. of like, you know, this is the, you know, sort of like someone has a, a, a thing they believe and they say, well, here's a proof text. So it's like, well, you always have to give a proof a text to prove what you're saying yeah. but proof texting can be very very dangerous it no, can be no cherry picking no cherry picking right. cherry picking is a good word for that They're very good so cherry picking is dangerous because you don't have like context what's the author's intention who's the audience what's the context what's before what's below what's the meaning of the word that kind of stuff and then what's it how is it coinciding with other parts of god's revelation um so of course you've got to give the 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 verse dump like here's the verses like yeah. examine those but there's something else, and I told Isaac this. I said, I am convinced of postmillennialism. Read the victory of the Messiah's kingdom within history before the resurrection. I'm convinced of it because of the mass of the texts mm-hmm. from the Old and New Testament that I believe are unavoidable, um, uh, irrefutable in terms of like, this is what the kingdom is supposed to do in the world within history. Mm. But I'll tell you what you're gonna hear today from Isaac truly from the bottom of my heart is i think the more convincing biblical argumentation but i like to start with the 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 text dump right like here's the text examine those you've got nature you've got timing you've got purpose and scope and goal it's all there in the text but what isaac's going to talk about are more thematic issues uh, that I think are beautiful. They tell a beautiful story about eschatology. And if you're watching this right now, you're thinking, what's eschatology? Um, it just has to do with uh, the view of the end, right? All Christians have a view of history that is going somewhere. It's mm-hmm. linear. So even when we have disagreements with each other over nature of the kingdom, timing of the kingdom, like what's going to happen, we're all in agreement with like this here, this final point. There's like, there's a goal that God is getting history to mm-hmm. where there's going to be ultimate victory. Now, we would argue that victory takes place within the scope of Earth's history, and then Jesus comes and defeats death. Um, but we're all in agreement. Jesus is returning, and right. that we're, there's going to be a physical resurrection. All of that, we're in agreement. But history is going somewhere. Yep. It's not like the pagan view of history, pagan right. views of history that, that are cyclical, right it's it's a cyclical view of history pagan pagan religions are all consistent with that essentially there's a cyclical view of history right just running in cycles uh and then you've got the materialist perspective of history uh and that would be sort of the atheistic perspective of history all of us come from ultimately bacteria Mm -hmm. you know from nothing something came and then you've got sort of this unguided chaos that's just moving I mean, literally, it's just moving through space. Human beings are just one other aspect of evolutionary processes that didn't have them in mind. And so the materialist perspective doesn't have a line of history. There's no meaning. Right. There's no telos. There's no goal. All it is is literally chaos. Yeah. It's just chaos with no meaning. All Christian eschatology is linear. Yep. It's a line with a telos, with a goal, right? You were going to say something? You gonna- Yeah. Yeah. Um- I I find this helpful. I heard it some time ago because when we think about eschatology, a lot of times we do narrow it down just to the end times, which eschatology does speak of end times. That's what it means. Um, Well, the study word itself, the study of end things. um, Think of those end things as ultimate things. So I think when you, when you think of eschatology, um, it's the study of ultimate things. And yes, the end is heavily involved in that as far as where things are headed. But even Christ in his first advent and that work was eschatological because he's bringing in 
in, in essence, the last days. He's bringing in a, a new age. But even that is eschatological, even though Christ's first advent isn't his second advent. Mm-hmm. It's still eschatological because it's bringing about ultimate things. Right. And just one thing I want to address something and just sort of challenge uh, our friends and brothers and sisters and viewers and listeners right now. There's a man in the comments, uh, Jason H., in the comments, and it just goes to show that the problem of uh, proper Christian interaction, right, and also false witness. Um, so I'll give you an example of, of being ignorant about a perspective and then bearing false witness about mm-hmm. that perspective. So Jason H. says uh, about MacArthur's perspective, which we love MacArthur. Mm-hmm. Um, MacArthur's perspective, someone says, MacArthur's eschatology is the worst. Jason says, MacArthur's is the Bible. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> um, so it says... Um, uh, Jason says, this is pretty much dominionism, might as well go, uh, L-O, uh, and someone says LOL. And so Jason says, might as well go to <laughs> Bethel. Um, oh that's, that's, false, that's false witness. Mm-hmm. So I, I just want to say, in terms of, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll grant that this is probably just pure ignorance on your part, and I mean that as respectfully as possible, but I can't say it in any other way that's meaningful. Pure ignorance mm-hmm. on your part, or it's, dis- it's one of two things, pure ignorance or you know, and mm-hmm. you're being deceptive to sort of firm up your commitment. So which one are you, ignorant or deceptive? I'm not sure. I don't know you. But I'll address mm-hmm. the ignorance aspect. It's dominionism. Well, if if you're referring to what Scripture says about Jesus in Psalm 72, that he shall have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth, then, okay, that kind of dominion, the dominion of the Messiah himself who brings his salvation to the ends of the earth, the dominion of the second Adam, the perfect Adam, who when God was call, God called Adam to take dominion over the earth and he sins and the curse comes and he fails, and then Jesus comes as the perfect Adam to spread his dominion and rule over the entire earth. Sure, I'll take that dominionism, yeah. but when you compare it to Bethel and things like the NAR, mm-hmm. it shows, again, ignorance or deception? Which are you? Because historic post-millennialism, I mean, was Athanasius, Contramundum, Athanasius, the the patron saint of postmillennialism, the one who protected the church from Arianism and Trinitarianism was preserved and heralded because of Athanasius. He's one of the giants of the Christian faith. Was he like Bethel? Because our perspective is consistent with his perspective. Or how about the Puritans? Were the Puritans like Bethel Church or the NAR? Do you really think that'll work? Historically, nope. that, that what we're saying with historic postmillennialism and the victorious view of the Messiah's kingdom in history, you th- really think it's like the NAR? You really think it's like the dominionism of like Bethel and other um, um, uh, shady churches or straight out heretic and false churches? Is it really the same or are you ignorant or deceptive? I'm wondering. And I would encourage you to uh, firm up your commitments to more accuracy in your dealing with brothers and sisters in Christ. Because, you know, I don't think Jonathan Edwards was like Bethel Church. And Jonathan Edwards was post-millennial. So what do you think? Are you ignorant or deceptive? I'll leave it to you to figure it out. I think this would be a good, before we get into Revelation, it's a good point to just kind of maybe clarify the two perspectives. Because there is a lot of confusion. We do get accused a lot of holding to the NAR, which is the New Apostolic Reformation, or the Seven Mountain mandate so essentially what they would say is that there's seven mountains like politics um like hollywood like stuff like that there's seven mountains that they have to essentially take dominion over and then that will usher in christ's kingdom um and so that's absolutely not what we believe uh we would say obviously we're already in christ's kingdom which we're going to get into Mm -hmm. and that we take dominion over those things from the bottom up through the proclamation of the gospel not top down right 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 and I, I would point out, and this is just this is a this is a loving, very humble, gracious nudge uh, to to Brother Jason and anyone uh, who might share his perspective. Um, it, it might surprise you to know that postmillennialism was the dominant eschatology of uh, early America, um, and so. Uh, you can thank the post-millennial worldview for much of the benefits and blessing you see around you today that, of course, I agree, are hanging on by a very th- a little thread at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, post-millennialism was uh, the popular eschatology. The Puritans were post-millennial. And so um, I don't yep. think we can compare the Puritan uh, church to Bethel. Uh, I think those are very, very far apart. Uh, they did not think the Holy Spirit was a blue genie, I can tell you that much. Personally, I wouldn't really put uh, the Puritans in line with Bethel myself. <laughs> Uh, but that was their perspective on history. Let's get into more um, 
and let's just jump right into the discussion. So I, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, there's two, there's two ways to look at this. One is the, the the text dump, the information dump from Scripture. Like, where do you go? What's it say? What what were they anticipating? What did Jesus teach? And then I think the thematic stuff is is just glorious. It really, really is beautiful. Uh, so let's just start. So you start in the very beginning of the Bible, and I'll at least touch on this for a second. In Genesis chapters 1 through 3, you have the creation of the world, literal creation of the world, literal creation of, of, of our first parents, Adam and Eve. In the image of God, he created them, right? And then Adam and Eve, um, they... They essentially sin against God. God says, do this, don't do this. The day you do, you'll die. And they sin. What happens then is the curse enters, the fall enters into the human race. But the glorious thing is that the first thing that God tells them is that he is going to do something. He's going to have the the seed of the woman, which is very, very unique, the seed of the woman, uh, crush the head of the serpent, right? So there's a death blow that's going to be delivered to the one who assisted in bringing death into this world, and yet this death blow is going to be wounding the seed of the woman. So there'll be a wound, but a heal wound is a temporary wound you recover from. A mortal blow is a blow to the head, which is what the serpent's going to get. Then God covers Adam and Eve in the skins of the animal. Obviously, there's a sacrifice that happens. It's pointing towards Jesus. They have no concept of what all this is really going to mean. But what do you know from there? You know Adam is supposed to be the image of God, the light of God into the world, and he's, he's told to be fruitful, multiply, to subdue the earth, to take dominion over the earth. Adam fails, and he sins against God. Now, that's very important because when Jesus comes and is, des- is described as the second Adam, he's described as what Adam was supposed to be, you've got to think about those themes. We're going to get to that a little bit later. But as you move forward through the text, what do we have we all agree on? You've got a covenant made with Abraham, and what is Abraham told? This is key. It's very, very important. It's something we need to keep in mind in this whole discussion about eschatology and the kingdom of the Messiah. Uh, Abraham is told, you're going to have descendants as numerous as as the stars. Now, brothers and sisters, that's a lot of stars. Hmm. Your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore. Brothers and sisters, that's a lot. Hmm. That's a lot. And we've got to consider that in terms of how we view history in terms of like many Christians feel like uh, the Christian church and Christians are going to be the great minority in Christian in, in Earth's history. I would say God describing the descendants through Messiah as as numerous as the stars that's a heck of a lot of stars. <laughs> that's a heck of a lot of sand. Uh, but then, okay, so that's first book. Genesis then goes to Genesis 49.10. It's a famous one, and I always illustrate this one, guys. I know I, I maybe I get heavy on this one, and I think I'm right for doing it because I'm heavy on it because Paul was. Uh, Genesis 49.10, it talks about Shiloh who's coming, mm. and it says to him, this one who's coming, and we're all in agreement, that's Messiah. Mm-hmm. Um, when Messiah comes, it says to him shall be the obedience of of the nations. To him shall be the obedience of the nations. That's Genesis. Hmm. What's interesting about that, and go check this later, in Romans 1 and Romans 16, Paul bookends, it's like his first thoughts and his departing thoughts of his systematic explanation of the gospel. I mean, where would we be without Romans, right? I mean, it's just so glorious. In Romans 1 and 16, opening thoughts, departing thoughts, he says that the purpose is to bring about the obedience of faith or the obedience that comes from faith among all the nations for his namesake. So think about that. Paul, the expert evangelist, the one who tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, the timeline of history, he bookends to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. That's Genesis 49.10. Shiloh's mm-hmm. coming, and to him shall right. be what? The obedience of the nations. Now, as you move, of course, we can't depart this conversation. You guys jump in at any time. I can't depart that conversation without pointing out that in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus' departing words are all authority in heaven and on earth has been, past tense, has been, past tense, given to me. Mm -hmm. We're not waiting for it. We're not. It's already been given to him. Where? Heaven and here. And here. Even though it doesn't appear so, those are the words of 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 the Lord of glory. That's what he said. It's all mine now. And he says, go and make disciples of all the nations. And he says, baptizing them, teaching them to what? Obey. Yep. So wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Shiloh was coming, and to him shall be the obedience of the nations. So then when Jesus comes, as he's departing, he says, go get the nations and teach them to 
obey. Observe all mm-hmm. that I can manage you. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. It's just that consistent theme. That's where we're going. But of course, you you continue on. I started the episode reading a popular verse that maybe you didn't notice because when I when it was first pointed out to me, I was like, no way. I've literally taught on that passage I don't know how many times, and I never even paid attention to that. In Psalm 22, that's the Passion Psalm. It's the one where it says, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which I think is glorious, by the way, because when Jesus said that on the cross, these are Jewish people, remember, in front of the cross, even the ones who were antagonizing him and who were betraying him. And these are people who were singing the Psalms in church. This is their songbook. So they had they had uh, had these songs on their lips in synagogue their whole lives, and here you have the Messiah on the cross saying, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" They should have started singing the rest of the song with him because that's how Psalm 22 starts. Mm. And in Psalm 22, it's the description of what was happening on the cross. It, they pierced his hands and his feet. His heart was like wax melted within him. He was pierced through. Um, it says that he was surrounded by dogs, and it says they, they cast lo- uh, clo- uh, lots for his clothing. And then in the same psalm, when the death of the Messiah, the passion of the Messiah is there, it ends with a promise of the resurrection because it says, I'll read it here, 22 of the same thing. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation will praise you. So we've got, he dies, and then he tells your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I thought he was dead. Because it says, you lay, you lay me in the dust of death. And then he tells them the name of God to his brothers. And then it says, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Well, what's the theme? The obedience of the nations. Jesus Mm. says, go get the nations, disciple them. Psalm 22 says, all the families will return to worship the Lord. Descendants as numerous as the stars, like the sand on the seashore. But you also have Psalm 2. Ask of me, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the very ends of the earth for your possession. Do you think Jesus forgot to ask? Because the Father says to Jesus, ask me, I'll give the nations to you for your inheritance, Mm -hmm. the ends of the earth, right? That's, That's what God promised Jesus, the Father promised Jesus. And then God warns the kings of the earth to obey Jesus or they'll perish. Now, question, do you believe that passage, that psalm? Of course you do. You're a believer. That's the word of God. So it says the kings of the earth are told to obey Jesus or they'll die. Mm -hmm. If, do you think that's future? Like in some, in like the eternal state? Who's dying in the eternal state for not obeying Jesus? Do you get it? This is within earth's history. The nations are yours. I give them to you. And now kings of the earth, obey my son. Or you'll perish. By the way, I'd say that has a lot to do with what's happening in America today. Yep. Mm. Uh, perishing nation is a nation that doesn't obey the king, King Jesus. Okay, so I'll go a little faster here. I Real know quick. I'm giving the blitz. Go ahead. Real quick. Um, if, if this is the first time you're hearing this, just understand that this isn't anything new. Uh, you mentioned the Psalms. I have a, a, a quote here from Spurgeon. And as you were um, saying that... I have you heard of him, Spurgeon? Spurgeon. Good, have, you heard, good man. have you heard of that guy? What? what? Is he currently alive today? Or? He's no, that's Todd, the, Todd White. Todd White. You guys, oh, you guys heard of oh, Spurgeon? Oh, is that what he said? Yeah, yeah. Every, okay. every, every reform guy was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, say that again? <laughs> well, I'd imagine that the, the, the guy who gave the comment earlier probably knows about Spurgeon. But this is what Spurgeon said concerning the Psalms. He said, David was not a believer in the theory that the world would grow worse and worse and that the dispensations will wind up with general darkness and idolatry. He says, Earth's sun is to go down tenfold night if some of our prophetic brethren are to be believed. He said, Not so do we expect. We look for a day when the dwellers in all the lands shall learn righteousness, shall trust in the Savior, shall worship thee alone, O God, and shall glorify thy name. The modern notion has greatly damped the zeal of the church for missions, and the sooner it is shown to be unscriptural, the better for the cause of God. It neither consorts with prophecy, honors God, nor inspires the church to adore. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautifully done. It, uh, I mean, it's littered throughout all the Psalms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can't read the Psalms. The Psalms um, are the church's war songs. Yeah. Right? It's, it's right. our victory psalms in many, yep. many ways. There's obviously sadness. And there's also depression and loneliness and despair, but it's always, but God, you. 
Like, even if I'm abandoned by my mother and father, God, you won't leave me. It's all, so there's a lot of hurt there, a lot of pain. It's for us to heal, to grow, to know God, to glorify God. But you can't read the Psalms without the victory of the Messiah. You just can't. You cannot. I'll give you an example. Another one, I already said it to you, but I'll just give it to you. For your reference, Psalm 72, uh, verse 8, it says, May he have dominion from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him, and his enemies lick the dust. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. Why were the Jews expecting a messiah Mm -hmm. who would win the entire world and rule the world because they were singing about it all the time psalm 110 1 it's the most popular verse in the new testament from the old testament so in other words god's favorite bible verse apparently pulled over from the old testament into the new you know it psalm 110 1 because you see it all the time in our new testament it says that the lord said unto my lord sit at my right hand until i make your enemies a footstool for Mm -hmm. your feet now paul the inspired apostle when he explains the timeline of earth's history he gives the gospel first corinthians 15 and then he says about jesus he's reigning now by the way um if he's seated please hear me on this because this was one of the things that really jolted me out of my dispensational premillennialism no offense to my brothers and sisters here who are listening who are dispensational premillennialism. Mm-hmm. I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you my truth. <laughs> I'm just giving you my story. Um, that was one of the things. Um, if we're wait, if we think we're waiting for Jesus to take the Davidic throne, the Messianic throne, uh, Paul didn't hold that perspective. He said that he's seated now yeah. at the right hand of the Father. Out, he's on David's throne, and it says that he must reign. Jesus is reigning now, according to Paul, first century, until, and then he quotes Psalm one ten one. All of his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. And then Paul says, as a timeline, he's reigning now. All enemies have to be made a footstool for his feet. And then it says, and then the last enemy is death. So we've got every enemy defeated, and then death is defeated, the resurrection of the just and the unjust. What's interesting there is it doesn't say in 1 Corinthians 15 that then Jesus brings the kingdom. Mm-hmm. It says that he delivers the kingdom over to the Father. Mm. Like, look look what I did. It's mm. done. Um, okay, so some more. Just to give you guys the verse dump, I, I want to get right to Isaac because I think it's so beautiful. Uh, but I want you to have these as a reference. Um, Isaiah, you could do so much, goodness. Okay. Um, Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2, go look at it. It's very, very important. Uh, Isaiah 2 says that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. Very, very uh, beautiful, uh, symbolic language. You've got to read the Old Testament to, hear, to, to learn about the mountain of the Lord and what that means. But it says the mountain of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. And it says that all the nations shall stream up to God's mm-hmm. mountain. So they're being drawn by God, apparently, in Isaiah 2. All the nations. There it is again. All the nations obeying Jesus, yep. all the kings of the earth coming to Jesus, everyone obey Jesus, all the nations. Then it says, all the nations in the kingdom of the Messiah are going to stream up to God's mountain. And it says that the law is going to go forth from Zion. The people of God is going to go forth out into the world. Isaiah chapter 9, famous Christmas Christmas, Christmas, Christmas <laughs> verse. Um, Merry, Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, it, says, uh, it says that uh, a son is coming, a child is given. So it's clearly a human, but it's weird, though, because this is like monotheistic Jews 600 years before Jesus saying this. He says, a son is coming, a child. So we go, okay, a human. But he's El Gabor. He's the mighty God, which was probably, people are like, hmm, that's weird. (laughs) Right? (laughs) A child, a son, mm, (laughs) but Yahweh. (laughs) I don't don't get it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And it says, uh, it says, um, it says that the government will be upon his shoulders. So he's the one that's in control of this. And it says, of the increase of his government, of his rule, and of peace, yeah. there will be no end. So according to Isaiah, there is, watch, progression with the rule of Christ and the peace that it brings. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. It says, upon the throne of David to establish with justice and righteousness forevermore. And it says, if you want to know, boy, Jeff, it doesn't look like it right now. We got mm. we got the Rona. We've got... Um, <laughs> We've got what's her name now? We got jo, uh, Joe Tommy Biden Harris. and uh, Tommy, Tommy Harris. Harris. Yeah. Hottest summer, uh, hottest summer in Phoenix on record. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't. How's this going to take place? Well, my answer is well. It started with eleven very confused disciples uh, following a recently murdered man in Palestine two thousand years ago, and we got believers all over the world today worshiping Jesus. You're listening to this globally right now. Mm. The gospel yeah. on the 
what wh- we say the airwaves not even the airwaves it's like oh, going World through Wide it's like go- worldwide web it's going through the ocean across a cable it's, across it's 5g world. baby it's going through your brain yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Right Satellite, your it's brain. everywhere yeah like, i don't know right. things are getting hard <laughs> well like it says the zeal of the lord of hosts will accomplish this so how is god going to have victory over the world with the messiah's kingdom the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You've got, of course, Isaiah 11. You've got Isaiah 42. Big one. Very important. That's, i got to say this one. one. My favorite. You, well, you do it. You know, you do, I'm, I'm doing all the talking. That's right. Yeah, I, I've been I've been thinking a lot about Isaiah 42 recently because I'm helping Zach Conover, which we're going to have another podcast very soon from Kauai. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying to help him get that going. But so we've been talking a lot about Isaiah 42. But mm-hmm. uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But just starting in verse 4, it says, He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law. And, you know, so this is all about Christ and his kingdom. And he's, he's bringing forth justice again to all the nations, to all the earth. Um, and I love the idea of the coastlands wait for his law. The idea is like the, the furthest point you can think of, they're waiting for his law. Yeah. You know, and so the it's so anti-dispensationalism, you know, because in that view, it's like, well, we need everything to suck really bad. And Christ is, is going to grow faint. He's going to grow so faint that no one's going to like him, you know. And then later, you know, after a bunch of stuff, then then maybe. Then justice will come. Then justice then will justice. come. You know, but I love that idea of the coastlands. They're waiting. Mm-hmm. Right. They're waiting. And who are the, you know, who's going to bring that? It well, needs to be us. Well, this will, yeah, through the gospel. And exactly. This, 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 I will just say this because this is, again, everything you're saying. I want to sort of like, I'm going to put, I'm going to drop some, some things that sort of anchor what you're going to be saying here. Okay. I think it's important. What is the distinction here, say, between post-millennialism and amillennialism? Now, there didn't used to be such a stark contrast between the two, um, but I would say pessimism is a big difference between yeah. post-millennialism and amillennialism. But another aspect that is a difference, and it's becoming more of a stark difference because of people who hold to two kingdom theology and that combined with amillennialism or within the framework of amillennialism um, i think there's a lot of gnostic tendencies i'm not calling them gnostics i'm saying gnostic tendencies in terms of like the physical is 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 cursed and bad god's not concerned with this and the physical kingdoms he's concerned with the spiritual the higher realities um i know i'm giving deep stuff people are like what are you even talking about right now but stuff like that is key isaiah 42 it mm-hmm. says that the servant of the Lord. Yep. It says that he's going to establish justice where? The nation. Here. Mm. That's like within the world. See, what we're saying is this postmillennialism gives you a biblical perspective of the spiritual and the natural. It doesn't divide them apart. It doesn't tend towards Gnosticism by saying that sin corrupted physical creation to the degree that it's a throwaway and that the spiritual is where you want to escape to. No, God's redeeming all yep. of it. And in the beginning, the spiritual and the physical were united and organically linked together. Sin breaks that um, relationship, but that's the glory of the Messiah and his kingdom, is that he comes in to bring the new creation and to make all things new. Not all new things. Yeah to make all things new, to bring this redemptive kingdom, this salvific kingdom, this kingdom that comes with justice and righteousness uh, in earth's history. Like Jesus is concerned, not just with taking your soul to heaven one day so you leave behind your humanity. He's concerned with the whole package, all of the earth. I mean, even creation itself is groaning, right? Right. there's, Mm. There's so much biblical theology attached to this. But Isaiah 42 is a big one for me because it promises that Jesus is concerned with justice. He will establish justice in the earth. He's going to do it. Mm -hmm. He will not grow faint or weary till he's done it. Um, That's that's earth. That's here. That's now concept. So some more, just for quick stuff, Daniel 2. Uh, a picture of like these four kingdoms and then the stone, right? It just, and it breaks. And then it says that that stone, that little rock becomes a mountain and it fills the earth. So this little stone comes in during the time of the fourth kingdom, which is, I believe, Rome. And of course, that's when Jesus and Paul and, and everybody and John the Baptist are saying the kingdom of God is at hand during the time of Rome, comes in during that time, destroys. It's a kingdom that lasts forever, but it starts like a stone, like a little rock. And then it becomes a mountain that fills the entire earth. Mm -hmm. That concept of progressive growth is there. You also have Daniel 7, night visions, son of man coming on the clouds. He comes up, direction is up. He comes up to the ancient of days. And it says, was presented before him. And to him was given kingdom, dominion, and glory. And it says that his, his kingdom 
uh, it was going to encompass all tribes, peoples, nations, and it says that his kingdom is one which would be everlasting, it'd never be destroyed. Well, that's Daniel 7. Well, Jesus went up, and Jesus, as he went up, he told us, go get those nations, right? And his kingdom is one which will never be destroyed. So again, you've got so many texts. I'm only just barely scratching the surface here. Trust me, I really, really am. Yeah. Um, uh, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Um, you, then you get into the New Testament. I'll just give you some bursts here. John the Baptist, kingdom of heaven at hand. Jesus, kingdom of heaven at hand. It says in Matthew 4 that Jesus was going about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I've always said... Many evangelicals today wouldn't even know how to articulate that. Hmm. Like we know how we know how, what it means to be saved, repent of your sins, trust in Jesus, be saved. That's good. We need to know that. We need to preach that. But can can we say that many evangelicals today would be able to articulate what's good news about the kingdom of Jesus? Like, do you have do you have a comprehensive perspective of like what is actually good about that? Because they thought it was a big deal, and it's the first thing Jesus is preaching when he comes out of the wilderness. By the way, the last temptation before he's saying it was Satan bringing him up to a high place and saying, look at all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give them to you all now. Why would he tempt Jesus with that? <laughs> because that's what Jesus came for. Yeah. Mm. The world, all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus has victory over Satan. He says, you, you should worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then he comes out of the wilderness victorious over Satan, over this trial. And it says that he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Do you see it? It's yeah. the theme. But then Jesus, of course, now timing. This is big. This is very, very big. Uh, they accuse Jesus in Matthew 10, 10 um, of being in league with the devil. And so they say to Jesus, well, we, of course he's casting out demons because he's working with Satan. Like, that's how mm -hmm. he's doing it. And so Jesus says this, if I cast out demons right. by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So if then, well, question to Christians, did Jesus cast out demons by the Spirit of God? Yes. Answer, then the kingdom of God, yeah. the rule of God had come upon them. Mm -hmm. um, so we can keep going for days with this, but you know this. You know it. All well, authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then, of course, Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's Revelation 1. That's current. And then, of course, this. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Do you believe that's true today? Right. Because scripture teaches it. His kingdom is here. It's arrived. It's, it's, he's ruling and reigning now on the throne of David, bringing this kingdom of salvation and peace with God throughout the entire world. And it's a transformative force in the world through reconciliation and peace with God via the gospel. Go ahead. Well, concerning timing, Zechariah 9, 9 through 10, um, we, we know what this is referring to. So just listen to what Zechariah says. He says, Listen to what is said. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And look what he says. He says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from river to the ends of the earth. When was that fulfilled? We know when that was fulfilled. Mm -hmm. When Christ in his triumphal entry on the fold of a donkey, mm -hmm. on the fold of a donkey, Zechariah is telling us what's going to take place when that is fulfilled. He's going to bring peace to the nations, and of course his rule shall be from sea to sea, river to the ends of the earth. Yeah, so that's you, timing. That's, yeah, exactly. Very, very much so. So, we wanted to give you the burst. I know there's more questions. I'll give you some recommendations. Two books, if you want to study this in depth, two books. One, uh, the in-depth study I think would be really helpful. It's a great book. It's very enjoyable. He Shall Have Dominion yep. by Kenneth Gentry. Very important book. He Shall Have Dominion by Kenneth Gentry. It'll go through all the texts. It does a very, very good job. Uh, Dr. Gentry does a good job of interacting with the best of the opposing arguments so that you can see them and then see the interaction back and forth with the text. So he shall have dominion. And then, of course, as a quick read that is just devastating and just so encouraging, uh, Postmillennialism and Eschatology of Victory by Greg Bonson. Uh, that's no. what it's called, right? I think that's what it's called. Po I or just read that one. Just read, read Postmillennialism by Greg Bonson. Oh, Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Um, it's Dr. Bonson, so yeah. you know how 
You know how he did. You know how he He's be. a beast. Um, so I would start with those two. Um, and then, of course, watch the big question. we got 16 minutes left here in this episode. So let's finish it with this one. The big question is Great Tribulation, right? All of it discourse, Great Tribulation. We cannot begin to do an entire show on the Great Tribulation today. But good news, I spent over one year on Matthew 24 at Apology at Church. <laughs> so mm. it's an ongoing... There's, there's, a, there's hours of yeah, content. Yeah, one year on Matthew 24... I hope is enough. <laughs> Maybe we'll add some more to it. I don't know. Uh, Matthew 24, we did one year in uh, at Apologia. It's all right here at Apologia Studios' YouTube channel. You can go back and you can listen to the detailed verse-by-verse exegesis and exposition of Matthew 24, the Great Tribulation passage. But I just want to show you this. Why is this important? Why is it important? Well, eschatology has consequences. Now, d- please forgive me here, Okay. I understand that there are respectable, dignified, honorable, powerful men of God, better men of God than I will ever be, and I mean that sincerely. Men like John MacArthur, who I love, I, I think he's just such a treasure and gift to the church, but I, I have very, very violent theological agreements with him in terms of eschatology, and I think it's actually destructive in many ways, but I love him. He's a brother. He's a better man of God than I'll ever be, and I genuinely mean that. So I understand that there are perspectives that we don't hold where you have honorable, strong, rigorous argumentation. But eschatology has consequences, I think, on every side. Mm -hmm. Well, here's uh, Pastor Jim Baker helping you stay alive during the apocalypse. Here we go, Gabe. Get that that ready for me. I think I got all this ready to go. Here we go. We have begun. Wait, actually, I'm sorry. This is me. This is me not controlling this properly today apologize is this the cheese sauce one this is uh i think the queso might be in here yes i think it actually is yes yes Uh, isaac would kill me right now if he was in the if he was in the back right now seeing what's happening with this he would kill me (laughs) the time of trouble Mm -hmm. and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger (laughs) be prepared this is it it. this is is it. it is It is, it is. I'm telling you. So the Lord said to me, Basta! I'm telling you, it's enough! Basta, Satan! I'm ready for lunch now. Some meatballs balls and basta. Yeah. yeah. It's like cram. Okay. I, 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 pu- I purposely pulled the funny little clip there because I want you guys to enjoy yourselves today and not take ourselves too seriously. But I just want, I'm just i pointing you to Vic Burgers. Um, uh, he chops up uh, Jim Baker's uh, end times buckets uh, into, into some of the most entertaining right, so clips on YouTube. Uh, but I, I'm pointing to Jim Baker. A person like him is not unlike many in fairly recent history who have um, profited off of people's uh, end times fears, Mm. uh, fear about the future, and taking uh, passages that we would argue, and many of the giants of the faith and history would argue, uh, passages that were about the destruction of Jerusalem and the impending judgment upon the covenant breakers in the first century, the promise of judgment upon those covenant breakers, it was for them. They're taking those verses, and they're putting them future to us, and then they're selling buckets of food and cheese sauce and poop um, shovels. Cheese sauce called Um, queso. uh, Yeah, exactly. They're profiting upon people's end times fears, and they're doing it on the basis of bad exegesis. They're taking texts that were for the covenant breakers in the first century, and God fulfilled those promises. It shows that Jesus was the Messiah, and they're saying, no, those are for us. It's our time, so buy these buckets. And guess what? They float. Like, that was like, hey, they float too. It's like, why do I care that they float? Am I going to like, it, like if there's a massive flood, I go, oh, good, I can at least, I can at least float on my bucket. Like, why, why is it? I, I'm sorry, I didn't even mention that. I was thinking to myself earlier, I was like, why is that a selling point? By the way, these float. For when there's another flood, if there's another the God flood, promise you wouldn't happen. Just, you have something to yeah. hang on to. You make a little raft for your family, and you guys can eat queso all day. Queso and chips while you're floating away. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, anyway... Uh, eschatology has consequences and times perspectives have consequences Mm -hmm. it breeds it's a breeding ground for charlatans like jim baker okay i'm not saying and do not please do not misinterpret this i'm not saying that other men 
godly men who hold to a different perspective are like Jim Baker. Right, right. I am not saying that. I'm saying there's a cliff you fall off of. Yeah. If you take a bad percent in times, it can become a breeding ground for guys like this to teach these very fallacious things and distort scripture and fleece God's people. Yeah. And so it's it's important. Also, I wanted to share that because I love watching yeah, it. Um, but also, one hilarious. more example of why it matters. This is important. One more example of why it matters. Um, uh, if you have a faulty perspective of the Great Tribulation passages, uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, uh, Synoptic Gospels, that's the Olivet Discourse of the Lord Jesus. If your perspective of that is that it's future to us, it's, it's, it's what's going to happen to us in the future, uh, well, I think that you do a lot of damage and disruption to the unity of uh, Jesus' discourse there, uh, to the unity of the promise of the Old Testament with mm-hmm. Messiah and what he was going to accomplish, salvation and judgment with his coming, covenant, mm-hmm. uh, covenant breakers are going to be judged. Uh, I know I'm talking fast here. Forgive me, guys. We just, I just want to get to Isaac and lay down something solid for you guys to be able to think about and time. reflect on. Uh, we're going to do your... You're going to get the whole next episode. Oh, I'm getting the whole The next. whole thing. So, But I wanted to give everyone this, this lead up and give you resources. You Why does it matter? <laughs> Atheists use the texts, get this, yeah. that I would use to show that Jesus is in fact the Messiah and that he fulfilled the promises and prophecies of judgment upon the covenant breakers in Israel. I, 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 well, here's what I'm saying. I use these texts to say, look, it happened. Jesus is the Messiah. But because of, I think, faulty perspectives of this discourse, the Great Tribulation, the Olivet Discourse, and Christians that put it future to us, atheists go, well, what's that? Oh, oh you're saying that that's, that's to come? Well, then Jesus is a false prophet. Mm-hmm. Which was like, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. Well, because that whole discourse, you have numerous examples there where you can pull from all those discourses where Jesus has like ahead of it and behind it, all these things are going to be upon this generation, the near demonstrative, the generation that he's then talking to, not that generation, this generation. Who? The ones that are going to see the destruction of the Jewish temple. Because don't forget, that's what starts the conversation in Matthew 24. They're pointing out the temples and the buildings. He just indicted Israel. He says, your house is left to you desolate. You're going to be judged. God's going to judge you. And then they're like pointing out the temple and the buildings. And Jesus says, you see all these things? There shall not be left one stone upon another. And they're like, well, when? And the answer is this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, why is it important? Check it out. My good friend, my good friend, I'll say it because I don't care. I'm my very good friend, Doug Wilson, a man that I love, I appreciate, I respect. Oh, boy. I've been to his house more times than I can remember personally. I have... uh, Please cut this up because... um, Here it comes. I have no problem with it. Doug Wilson, one of my heroes like of the faith, like the a Cowboys. friend, a brother. Um, I've been Worse to his his games. house to eat. Um, he's been he's uh, we've been out. To, uh, he, he, I don't know, lunch and dinner more times than yeah. I can even personally remember. Uh, I've taught with this man side by side. Mm. We've done so much together. Um, he is uh, he's a he's a blessing to the church. He's a gift to the church. And um, uh, he debated Christopher Hitchens, um, one of my very favorite atheists. In history, I actually downloaded um, uh, for the plane ride. I downloaded Christopher Hitchens, uh, like two of his books, mm. not related to atheism, mm. other stuff, because he's actually a good journalist. Yeah, he's he's a good excellent. Writer. He's a great writer. He's so mm. fun to read. Uh, anyway, all that to say, Doug debates Christopher Hitchens. Hitchens loses badly throughout this entire film collision and the debates that took place that made it into the film. And Chris Hitchens didn't know how to handle Doug many times. Because Doug just so calmly just whoop, takes his legs off on all these arguments. This is a point in the debate at Westminster where Christopher Dudge does what atheists do. He goes to the chestnut argument atheists will use to refute your faith. And that's that Jesus gave false prophecy. Where? The Great mm-hmm. Tribulation, Matthew 24. How and important is this? Go I was going to say, and not just atheists. The cults love to use this as well, like Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. Any, yeah. Anyone, yep. any cult that's built around bad eschatology that yeah. has a ton of false prophecies the moment you bring up the false prophecies of their founders are like well, what about jesus in matthew 24 he had false prophecy too yeah. he said he was going to return yeah. uh before that generation all passed away and my answer to them is always uh and he did <laughs> right in judgment not resurrection second coming kind of thing 
but like Yahweh did throughout the entire Old Testament, mm-hmm. came on the clouds against Egypt, Isaiah 19. Uh, God coming on the clouds to judge Egypt. Um, uh, was that literal, or was that God coming as the sovereign to judge the nation and destroy them? Uh, God came in judgment many times in the Old Testament. So yeah, did Jesus come in judgment upon the covenant breakers in the first century like he promised before they all died? Uh, yes, he did. And proof of that is uh, the scattering and the destruction of the Jewish temple. Not one stone left upon another, just like right. he promised. But watch this. Here's Doug taking the legs off of Hitchens in about 60 seconds. <laughs> on this question you just must see it make sure it's turned up nice and loud for you guys here and resuscitations occurred yes but jesus was the first person in history to come back from the dead never to die again and so say the, he would reappear in the lifetime of his disciples no yes now he said he was going to come back and destroy jerusalem which he did in 70 a.d right on the money it was the Roman Empire didn't do this. No, it was the, he said this, gener- this generation will not pass away until all these things will, are fulfilled. Oh. The sun, the, oh the, the the moon. Hang on a second. This is really important, actually. <laughs> I know it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In when Jesus when Jesus says in Matthew twenty four the moon the sun's going to go out and the stars fall from the heavens he's quoting from Isaiah thirteen and Isaiah thirty four. Um, there's decreation language throughout the Old Testament. Every time it occurs in the Old Testament, it always refers to a dis- military destruction of a nation or a city-state. Always. In Isaiah 13, yes. an oracle against the king of Babylon. And then you have the same decreation language. Then Jesus says in Matthew 24, not one stone's going to be left on another. The disciples say, when it's going to happen? Jesus quotes Isaiah. So Jesus is not talking about the end of the space-time universe. He simply isn't has nothing whatever to do with that. It has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened within one generation, just as Jesus said, authenticating have, him as a prophet. Don't you have an abnormally unsuspicious mind? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> End. How? Hmm. Exegesis? How? Faithfully handling the text? Christopher didn't know what he walked into. Didn't know. Um, Probably didn't even know Jesus was quoting from Isaiah 13. The sun, the moon, and the stars, stars falling from the heavens. You know, let's be honest, many evangelicals don't know that. That when Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple being destroyed, and then he starts talking about the blood and the moon and the sun and the stars, most evangelicals start looking up going, oh, the stars are going to hit the earth. But Jesus is quoting from Isaiah 13. It's It's the language that God uses. He uses dramatic prophetic hyperbole Listen, throughout the Old Testament, he does. He uses that language to describe the judgment he's going to bring. It wasn't literal when it happened to Egypt or Babylon. It wasn't. The star didn't, stars didn't literally hit the earth. By the way, our sun is a star. If it got a little closer, um, it'd be even hotter than it is right now in Arizona, which is hard to believe. Um, but the stars are not literally going to hit the earth because they didn't in Isaiah 13 when God destroyed them. So when Jesus quotes Isaiah 13, he's talking about God's judgment destroying a nation, yeah. a city, or a state. Uh, that's what, and look, the answer coming back from Hitchens is, is it pitiful. There's, he has no response. Why? Because Doug shows that Jesus actually fulfilled the promise. Um, Christopher uses that argument against unsuspecting Christians with a bad eschatology. And he probably has knocked down moments with Christians who can't handle great tribula- the Great Tribulation passage in a consistent biblical way, mm-hmm. and so Hitchens got the chestnut. Okay, I'll throw this one mm-hmm. out. He, he, he said he was going to appear before they all died. Well, he said he was coming to, back to judge the covenant breakers, and he was going to destroy Jerusalem, and he did, on time, yeah. 70 AD. Yeah. It was all over. It was um, anticipated. Yeah. John the Baptist, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Uh, mellow is the word there, about to come. Yep. About to come. Yeah. Um, I was mentioning this to you the other day, but it's interesting because in 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul gives us a description of the proper use of tongues, ultimately they're significant in that they're a sign. They're a sign gift, right? Mm-hmm. And they're for a specific purpose. Um, in 1 Corinthians 14, he actually quotes from Isaiah 28 and he says in the law it is written by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people and even then they will not listen to me says the Lord and then verse 22 of verse 14 of 1 Corinthians he says thus tongues are a sign not for believers 
but for unbelievers. And what he's quoting there from in Isaiah 28 is Isaiah 28, I think, is promising either the northern kingdom or Judah that judgment's coming, okay? And one of the signs is that God is not going to speak to you in a language that you don't know because there's other people coming, Babylonians that are coming that are going to speak a different language. Mm -hmm. The sign of the languages was a sign of judgment is coming. Right. So you Mm -hmm. see that in uh, Acts chapter Mm 2 when... um, there's there's languages differing languages where they're each understanding what they're saying the glory and the works of god Mm -hmm. um judgment's coming that's the sign it was testimony that judgment was coming and paul says that in first corinthians 14 he's saying the reason we have this gift these languages these tongues it's not for the believers for the unbeliever because it is a sign that judgment is coming. That's right, exactly. Mm-hmm. And don't forget, in that uh, famous Pentecost sermon that the Apostle Peter preaches, he tells them from Joel 2, in the last days, and don't don't misunderstand that, last days is just the last days of the Old Covenant. That's what they were anticipating. This was going to be su- this was gonna be summarily finished, and then the New Covenant was coming in. So that, that we can't think like 21st century Gentile Christians, last days, oh, of my history? No, they were thinking about Old Covenant, New Covenant, yeah. Messiah's Kingdom, New Covenant. It literally said end of the age, yeah, end, not of, the end age. of the world. End of the age, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Peter says at Pentecost, he says, this... What you're seeing, these signs, these miracles, these tongues, he says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. So what do you read in Joel? Right. In the last days, he says, I'll pour out my spirit. There'll be signs and wonders. He says, the old men will have visions Mm -hmm. and dream dreams. And then it says what? This is very important. Because if you had, listen, if you were standing there with Peter and he's like, hey guys, what you're seeing right now is what <laughs> Joel said. Well, you go back and you flip to that scroll of Joel. You're like, all right, so we got visions, dream dreams. And then it says, and then blood and fire and pillars of smoke until the great and awesome day of the Lord. It's like this now judgment. So what what was what was the context of Peter's sermon there? He was like, hey, Israel, uh, what you're seeing is what Joel said was going to happen uh, before the end of the old covenant and then the judgment Mm -hmm. that's going to fall on us. And isn't it interesting, we can end on this, 30 seconds, perfect. Uh, When Stephen, who's the first martyr recorded in Acts, Mm. is brought like up and they're going to kill him, what was the charge against Stephen? Just go, go read Acts. Just go read it, brothers and sisters. What's the charge against the first martyr? What were they saying he was saying? Now, I know they had malicious intent, but what were they saying? What was his message? They said about Stephen... He's saying that this Jesus is going to come back and destroy this place and the customs that Moses delivered to us. Hmm. Apparently, Stephen was telling him, Hmm. uh, hey, everybody, uh, Jesus is going to come back and judge this generation or destroy this temple and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Hey, that sounds like Matthew 24 and Mark 13, Luke 21. It sounds like Matthew chapter 3. It sounds like the summary of the entire New Testament yeah. of the constant warnings, like, uh, he's standing at the door. Hebrews. He's coming quickly. Uh, in a little while, he's going to shake not only heaven, but also earth, yeah. and, and he's going he's gonna to destroy this. Mm-hmm. It sounds like the consistent message of the Old and New Testament that the Messiah's kingdom came with salvation and with judgment. Judgment right. upon whom? The covenant breakers of Israel. And it leads us perfectly. Thank you, Lord. Um, it leads us perfectly into our discussion about the book of Revelation, which you're going to get next Thursday, and you're going to get all of Isaac, a ton of Isaac in this one, because I love to just sit and listen to him talk about this stuff. I know you're probably worried about that, but just do your thing. <laughs> um, it leads us into Revelation. What's that book about? Let me give you a, a whet your appetite. A whet your appetite about it. I think a good title over Revelation is what my friend was going to call one of his commentaries, The Divorce of Israel. Hmm. Um, I think it's a mm-hmm. covenantal story, and I think it's about a harlot wife who's adulterous mm-hmm. um, that God finally gives the death penalty to. And it's about a new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, who brings the offer of salvation and the waters of life to the world, who has right. leaves for the healing of the nations. Right. Um, it's a story about covenant sanctions. Uh, like, okay, let's wrap that more. Four horsemen? <laughs> Four horsemen. People are like the four. That, where there's all kinds of art and crazy stuff about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It sounds stinking scary, right? The four horsemen of the apocalypse, and it's like famine, war, pestilence, and all this stuff. And you go, um, 
that sounds familiar. I've read the Bible before. Where did I hear about four judgments in the Old Testament? Four horsemen, four judgments. Oh, that's from Ezekiel. Is it 1616? Sorry, but you, go, go look it up. God talks about the four judgments that he's going to bring upon Israel when she turns away from him. And guess what those four judgments are? Mm. The four judgments of yep. the four horsemen yeah. of the apocalypse. Uh, Revelation is a covenantal book. It's about the sanctions that God promised upon the covenant, uh, the covenantally unfaithful. Mm -hmm. It's about a harlot wife that's finally put away and given the death penalty. And it's about an old Jerusalem and a new Jerusalem. It's yeah. about two cities, one that is destroyed and one that is brought that brings life to the world. So, all right, so mm. we guys are going to- we are going to give you a part two. What we're going to do is actually... Part two. Part two next week, yeah. Thursday. And it's going to be all... We're going to be at Revelation themes, overarching themes. You don't want to miss it because I'm excited. Uh, you're going to hear a ton from Isaac. It'll bless you. Um, any last words? This is good. I'm excited to get to the next show. So Yeah. Yeah, I know. When we talk about Christ's kingdom, it's interchangeable with dominion. Yeah. So next week, we're going to talk about God's intentions from the beginning. We know that in the beginning, there is a mandate for dominion. So us talking about the kingdom just kind of fits perfectly into that. So we'll, Very good. we'll talk more about that. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for participating with us in ministry. ApologiaStudios.com is where you guys go to get more. A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A Studios.com. Get us there. Thank you all so much for your love. Thank you so much for your constant encouragement. Uh, thanks for blessing us. Uh, just praying for us. And uh, I, I, by the way, I get so many of your messages. I can't get back to all of them. I apologize. We're busy being pastors to our church here, but I do see them, and I do praise God when I read those stories. I can't always get back, or I'd be on the front of a computer writing all day. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for those constant words of encouragement. Love you all. Bless you. Catch you next week. <laughs>